Danny Biss, if you would like to start by describing yourself. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. And thanks to everyone. What a great crowd. I'm really looking forward to tonight. This is a scary time, let's be honest. Donald Trump is the president and Bruce Rauner is the governor and our core values are under attack. And in a lot of ways, it reminds me of the moment that brought me into politics. I wasn't planning to be doing any of this stuff. I wasn't planning to be in the legislature or running for governor one day. I was teaching math and saw a nation spinning out of control as it rushed off to war based on lies and saw a movement of people coming together to do something about that, to change our politics, and realized I had to be a part of that. I wasn't gonna just sit back and watch as I was upset about the direction. I was gonna step up and start knocking on doors and organizing people. And in doing that, I came to understand that the most powerful thing in the world is a movement of people ready to transform our society. And listen, the state of Illinois is in need of transformation because we have unbelievable opportunity ahead of us if only we were to have a state government that would lift up ordinary people, that would lift up the middle class, that would lift up the poor. It's time for us to fight for universal health care as a right and not a privilege. It's time for us to fight for free tuition at public universities and community colleges across the state of Illinois. It's time for us to fight for universal access to childcare and family leave so that families can work and have families in a healthy way at the same time. It's time for us to build a state government that at long last works for the rest of us. And the question facing us in this campaign is whether in this moment of pain, this time of anxiety and uncertainty here in this country and in this state, will we use the energy that exists across the state to build a new politics and change what's possible? Because we have been told for decades what's impossible in the state of Illinois, but what we in this room know is that if we fight to change what's possible, we can have a state that works for everyone, not only a few. My name is Daniel Biss. I'm running for governor for the same reason I left the classroom to go into politics in the first place. Because if we use the power of people across the state of Illinois to build a new political movement, we can have a state with opportunity and a better life for everyone. Okay, I look forward to the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob Diver. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Diver. I'm from uh, Marine, Illinois, in Madison County. I'm the first candidate for run for governor as a Democrat from Southern Illinois in 20 years. Uh, what does that say about the state? I do not believe Illinois should be governed by one county. There's 102 counties in the state of Illinois, and there's some of us that feel that we have been forgotten. I spent 28 years in the classroom. I was a labor leader. I spent my last 10 years uh, as regional superintendent, providing thousands of hours of man hours of work through project labor agreements. I said yesterday in a press conference, I strongly support maintaining the prevailing wage in the state of Illinois and collective bargaining rights for people who work in the private and public sectors. That is the issue that is at stake. That's what Bruce Rauner's turnaround agenda was about, and that's what Bob Diver opposes. I've been bold in my platform as I've came forward as a gubernatorial candidate. I laid out a progressive tax model, one that will work, one that gives working class people tax relief, one that asks the wealthy to pay more. That's what Bob Diver believes. If you are going to elect a governor that's going to be a Democrat in this next election, you have got to pick a person who has not just policy, but that has got guidelines to their plans. And that's what I continue to lay out as I campaign. My campaign is about everyday people. My wife, Karen, who I'm married to for 25 years, that's with me tonight. And I have two growing boys that go to Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. We know the price of higher education, and that's why I've said, as governor, funding education will be my first appropriation bill, and I'll restore higher ed funding at the 2012 level. I, I've been an educator, I know education, I know the business. It's the most important thing that we deal with in this state. And that's why I should be your next governor. Thank you very much. Thank you. T.O. Hardiman. Okay. <clears throat> I'm T.O. Hardiman, Democratic candidate for governor here in the state of Illinois. 
I ran for governor back in 2014 and secured close to 30 percent of the state vote, winning 30 counties downstate, 30 counties downstate. I'm running again. My running mate, her name is Patricia Avery. She's from Champaign-Urbana. She's a former county commissioner in Champaign-Urbana and a former president of the NAACP. We have a 30-year combined history of community leadership and working with people on all levels in society. I'm currently serving as an adjunct professor in restorative justice at North Park University and Governor State University. And we have a 2020 plan, which represents a perfect vision to help move the state of Illinois forward. Part of our plan includes supporting a progressive tax making sure that we uh, tax wealthy people according to their income status instead of taxing all the poor and working class people. We also support House Bill 453, which is a financial transaction tax. These two taxes combined can bring in an estimated $6 billion of new revenue to the state of Illinois, which we will use those funds to help support programs and boost <coughs> the economy in, in southern Illinois. It's very important to boost the economy in southern Illinois. We also have a plan to support veterans, I would never, as your governor, think about imposing a tax on your retirement funds. I would never think about imposing more taxes on working class people and consumers, like a gasoline tax. I'm a new type of leader. I, want, I would like for everybody to think out of the box and support T.O. Hardiman and Patricia Avery for governor and lieutenant governor. Our plan includes the service in the veterans, reopening some of these mental health institutions, and decriminalizing marijuana and uh, legalizing small amounts of recreational use marijuana to bring in some new revenue as well. We have a lot of issues that the state is facing right now, and we have a plan to bring the state together, you know, together as one, which is so important. I've been doing a lot of work for many, many years on all levels. I have a master's degree in inner city studies, and I have been married with children for the last 18 years. So I'm your governor. I would like to be your governor. I'm glad to be here in downstate. We just had a, a fundraiser in Troy, Illinois. I have a lot of friends in Belleville, Carpentersville, friends in East St. Louis. And as you know, okay. East St. Louis has not had no redevelopment over the last I'm 30 sorry. years. Gio, I'm okay, sorry. That's it? Yep, that's oh, it. Well, I'm sorry. right at home. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Chris Kennedy. Yes, indeed. So I, I'm Chris Kennedy. I'm one of Bobby Kennedy's and one of Ethel Kennedy's 11 children. I've seen the state from lots of different vantage points and, and loved it in every way I've seen it. I first came to Illinois in 1986 to move to Decatur to work for ADM. And they, they had me in all these little grain elevators all over Illinois buying corn and soybeans from farmers. I worked at the crushing plant in Decatur. I worked at the alcohol plant up in Peoria. I traded barge freight up and down the Mississippi River from a small exchange that doesn't exist anymore that was over in St. Louis. Eventually, I ended up in Chicago. I ran the Merchandise Mart. It's one of the great economic engines of the world. More companies moved to Illinois to open an office for the first time at the Merchandise Mart Center than any other location in the state when I ran it. I know how to get companies to move here and expand once they arrive. My peers and colleagues at the Chicago Convention and Tourism Bureau, 2,000 of them, elected me as chairman because they knew I could use tourism as an economic development play, not just at McCormick Place and Navy Pier, but through counties throughout the state where there are uh, plenty of tourism destinations that we can promote and drive economic development. My wife, Sheila, and I run Top Box Foods. It's an anti-hunger program that operates all over northern Illinois. Our customers, our clients, remind us of the people who are being left behind by this economy. Sheila and I have four kids. Three are out of college, one's a freshman. They're going to decide where they're going to spend the rest of their lives. We want to keep them close to home. If we're lucky, we have grandkids, we want to be around those grandkids, and we want them to be around us. I spent five years as chairman of the board of the University of Illinois. I understand what economic development can, can be uh, developed from our great universities. I believe in education-based economic development. A hundred years ago, our community came together, engineers, activists, environmentalists, business people, and political leaders, and they changed the direction of the flow of the Chicago River. We need to come together once more, engineers, environmentalists, politicians, business people, and change the direction of this state. Thank okay. you all very much. And Robert Marshall. Well, my name is Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Robert Marshall. I'm a physician. I live in Burr Ridge, which is one of the suburbs of Chicago. I work at Oak Forest Hospital, which is one of Cook County hospitals. We take care of the poorest of the poor and the sickest of the sick. I actually grew up in Dayton, Ohio. My father was a policeman. And my mother was a homemaker. We lived in public housing, or the projects, we call them. 
I won scholarships to schools in the East, including Harvard Medical School. And then I was in the Army. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was there for a year and a half. And then I came back here, and I've been living in Illinois for 38 years. I have an office in Berwyn, which is one of the suburbs up there. My running mate is an African-American man in his 60s. Uh, he has five daughters. So I guess that makes him a good politician right there. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a custodian for a Lutheran church uh, up there, and uh, I wanted to bring him, but he had to work. So he's a, he works seven days a week to, from paycheck to paycheck, basically. I got into politics because uh, I'm a, I, I felt very bad and uh, objected greatly to all of these wars that were involved in seven undeclared wars plus Korea. And I learned a lesson from Vietnam, I hope, and a lot of people didn't. But we were involved in too many wars and it's time for us to get out of them. <clears throat> uh, my platform uh, is uh, basically uh, divided into three parts. as to end this war on drugs in this uh, country. It's been going, going on for many, many years. It's, uh, it's not a war on drugs. Uh, drugs don't go to prison. People go to prison. It's a war on people. And we need to end it. We need to legalize marijuana throughout the state and, and decriminalize cocaine and morphine. Number two, I oppose tax increases. And number three, I have a plan to divide Illinois up into three brand new states. I have to stop you there, I'm sorry. And that's where we'll end, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> JB, JB Pritzker. Thank you, Th thank you to Jim and to Brandon, to all of you for being here this evening. I'm J.B. Pritzker, and I've been listening to hardworking people all across this state who've been neglected for far too long, especially here in southern Illinois and central Illinois. I've been listening to the students and faculty here at SIUC, to the entrepreneurs at the SIU Research Park, to the farmers at the Farm Progress Show in Decatur, and to the early childhood educators and families at the TLC Learning Center in Carterville. And I've heard and seen the devastation that Bruce Rauner has brought to too many families and communities across the state, but also the leadership in Springfield for far too long. Now, we have a diverse state, and there are different concerns in Chicago than there are in Carbondale. But we need a governor who will represent all of them, and who will show up when you need him. I'm very proud to have the endorsement of Senator Dick Durbin and Senator Tammy Duckworth and Representative Sherry Bustos and so many leaders across Southern Illinois and the state AFL-CIO and the 30 individual labor unions across the state. Here's what I know. We need to get back to addressing the kitchen table issues that are so important to working families across the state. And that means job creation. It means lowering the cost of health care. It means investing in higher education and making sure that every child in this state, no matter what zip code, gets a quality education. Now, I've put out real plans for addressing these challenges. I've spent my life trying to make a difference across the state of Illinois and it's why I'm running for governor. I believe we need to put Springfield back on the side of working families. Thank you. Thank you. Now, our first question uh, will go to Bob Diver, um, and then, then every other uh, candidate will uh, rotate uh, to answer the same question. And it's this. Describe your leadership style and explain how it makes you uniquely capable of uh, working with those of the other party or with anyone in the legislature um, in the best interests of the state? Sure. I lead by example. Uh, you cannot ask people to do things if you're not willing to do those yourself. I was taught that as an athlete. And that's where my leadership style developed from, from, from playing sports. And so I believe you have to be in the game. You have to be the guy that's going to take the tough shot. Okay? You have to be the person who steps out in front and that's what I've done as a candidate for governor, is that I have stepped out in front, and I've done the bold thing. I'm the guy that laid out a progressive income tax model with real numbers in it. I'm the guy that stepped up and said, I would ban dicamba because it's a harmful pesticide. You know, that is true leadership. And then what do you have to do? 
you've got to be willing that you're open-minded, that you're going to go in and you're going to work with legislators, that you're going to be collaborative, you're going to be willing to compromise, you're going to have to understand give and take as a governor who's going to lead. You've got to be a good listener. And that's something that I learned in my career as an educator. And I served 20 years in local government. And I will tell you this. I didn't go away every night as an elected official always having won. You don't. Time's up. <clears throat> Sorry. You got it. Next. Sit. Okay, yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, my birthday is September 21st, but I won't tell you the year. But I was born on the International Day of Peace. <laughs> my entire life has been a, a, a bridge builder bringing people to the table of peace. So I will work across the aisles with uh, everybody to make Illinois uh, a whole state so everybody's involved. My leadership style would be bringing the most brilliant minds to the table here as part of my administration to make sure that we move the state forward one step at a time. I've, I've been in leadership positions my entire life. When I first started at UIC School of Public Health, we had a budget of $300,000 over the last 13 years. I helped raise money for violence prevention to the tune of $25 million. I used to oversee a budget of $10 million a year, a year. We had a meticulous track record. I never ever missed a report or anything like that. So leadership, my leadership style also is to be open-minded to listen to my running mate, who is Patricia Avery, with 30 years of experience in leadership roles. So we have to listen to some of the people we have on board as our you know, consultants or advisors to make sure that we get it right. See, we don't have time to get it wrong anymore. So I have a, pro a proven track record, a track record of getting things right here in Illinois and in my personal endeavors as, as a business person. So that's what I plan, how we plan to lead the state together. Okay. okay. Thank you. Chris Kennedy? You were born on International Peace Day. Yes. I was born on the 4th of July. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you like peace, I like revolution and independence. <laughs> that's, uh, that's okay. We'll find out where the rest of these fellas are. Um, so when I was running the Merchandise Mart, the, we ran 90 different trade shows in 30 different vertical markets, and they were all very, very different. Everything from well, heavy construction to women's to bridal gowns, women's and children's clothing, men's suits, uh, contemporary art, and each of them had to be run by people who understood the very subtleties and nuances in that market. So it taught me to work with a very diverse group of leaders. At the University of Illinois, we took maybe 60 votes at each of the six meetings we had a year, maybe 360, 400 votes each year for five years, thousands of votes, and there's not one vote which would have been better if I had made it alone. I believe in the power of collaboration. People ask me what kind of politician I am, where I fall on the spectrum. I say, I'm a Kennedy Democrat, a Ted Kennedy Democrat, because Teddy always had friends in the Republican Party. He worked hard at that, and that allowed him to pass incredible legislation. I don't believe compromise is surrender. I believe we need to get along with everyone. I have to stop you there. Okay, Dr. Marshall. Well, there's two types of uh, leadership in this world. There's positive and negative uh, reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is uh, bullying people, uh, bad-mouthing them, uh, uh, firing them. Uh, this is basically this is basically Donald Trump's uh, uh, strategy. The other strategy is positive reinforcement. You encourage people you, when they do something right. You, you say you did this right. This was good. This was very good. And, and this is positive reinforcement type of leadership. That's what I use. Now, how do you tell them that they're doing wrong? Well, you in general you say nothing, and they get the point. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> J.B. Pritzker. Well, so over the course of decades now, um, I've tried to get big things done across the state of Illinois and 230,000 kids getting school breakfast in low-income school districts and thousands of kids getting quality preschool and quality child care because for more than 20 years I've been a national leader in that. Um, I've I think I'm the only candidate on this stage that's created thousands and thousands of jobs, and I, I've fought for civil rights. And in accomplishing those things, those big things here in Illinois, I've used really the same leadership style uh, for each one of them. And that is, you provide leadership and a vision for where you want to go, but then you bring everybody in the room. You make sure that you've got community leaders and nonprofit leaders, elected leaders, and ordinary Illinoisans who care deeply about an issue, and then you work together toward the vision of accomplishing that goal. 
We've had too little of that in Springfield over the last number of years. Bruce Rauner thinks that he can show up and order people around. That's not how it works. You have to work collaboratively. I intend to work across the aisle, but with principled leadership, progressive democratic leadership. Thank you. And Daniel Biss. My leadership style is to listen more than I talk, to learn from everyone around me, to ask a lot of the people around me, but to always make sure I'm asking more of myself, and to make sure that I'm working harder than the people around me to make sure I'm questioning my assumptions carefully, aggressively, meticulously, and learning from people who are different than me. I want to introduce my running mate, Latissa Wallace. She's an extraordinary state representative from the city of Rockford. I was proud to choose a running mate from outside the Chicago area because I want our ticket to be one where we're listening around the state and learning from around the state. I'm proud to have passed almost 90 bills into law in the legislature creating coalitions people didn't expect to see, working across the aisle with Republicans that I might disagree with 95% of the time, and I see that as a chance to work together 5% of the time. We need more of that in Springfield. I'm proud of the record that I've established, and I know that when Latisse and I are governor, lieutenant governor, we're gonna be able to transform Springfield by bringing everyone together and move the state forward. Thank you. I have a question about the politics of Southern Illinois and how you see it. In 2016, Donald Trump carried Southern Illinois by a wide margin, getting almost 80% in some counties. Yet some of you have called the president a racist and a bigot. I'm curious to see how you see the people, the majority of people in Southern Illinois who voted for the president share some of his views maybe not in this room, but they share some of his views. <laughs> <laughs> and they continue to support the president. What would you call them, Mr. Hardiman? Well, no, we are one big family here in Illinois. To me, we are human beings. Uh, I don't think nobody in this room voted for Trump. I mean, that's your, you know, I'm just, to answer your question more directly, my, I look at Southern Illinois as, as totally part of all of Illinois, and we have to bridge the gap. That's our job as leaders. I think that some of our former and current leaders have not been successful in bringing Illinois together, and that's something that needs to happen. So once I become the governor and my lieutenant governor, we plan to organize events throughout Illinois to make sure that we work on unifying the state. That's important. I cannot get caught up in other people's personal politics. Donald Trump has shown some racist, you know, tendencies. He's made comments about Africa, the people in Haiti, El Salvador, and if, you, if, if he wants to keep going, he'll start making comments about everybody. So he's displayed those type of characteristics, so there's no system playing with that, but I think everybody in this room today, we, we are one. I'm a progressive Democrat, okay? And I believe in running this state from the bottom up instead of from the top down and making sure that we hear the voices of the poor, working class and middle class people sincerely. So Trump is not really on my mind right now. What's on my mind is make sure Illinois gets it right for the people, okay? That's my response. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I, I, think, I think it's a mistake not to listen to those voices, those voices of people who were voting for Donald Trump. I think they're angry. I think they're raging. I think they're well, ticked off that the promise of this country hasn't been kept. This notion that we're the land of opportunity where anybody can make it. Land of unlimited opportunity, not only for ourselves, but for our children. I think that's not true in the United States anymore. Today in America, if you're born poor, you'll probably stay poor. If you're born rich, you'll probably remain rich. If you're born in between, you're gonna have a life of constant threat and hazard. That's nobody's idea of the American dream. Donald Trump, tapped into that anger, that notion that the promise of our country hasn't been kept, that we were abandoning the very thing that made us unique among the, the family of nations in this world. If we don't restore the American dream, if we don't restore upward economic mobility, we'll elect somebody worse than Trump, somebody who can read a memo, someone who will sit for a briefing, someone who won't tweet things that allow us to get rid of a Muslim ban. If we don't fix this country, something worse will come. Thank you. Mr. Marshall? Well, Mr. Trump, unfortunately, hit the nail on the head. You've been ignored down here. Right now in this situation in this state, you've got one county, or actually one part of a county, 20% of the state and a small number of people bossing around the other 80%. That's the downstate area. And my uh, solution to this problem is dr drastic, but I think it'll work. That's to divide this state up. 
into three brand new states. Chicago's a state, the suburbs, and then everything south of Route 80 is a, is a new, brand new state. You will not be associated with, politically with Chicago anymore. You will be, you have a new, your own governor, two senators, two electors, electorate and electoral college. You'll be independent of uh, the rest of the state. And uh, the, the sky is the limit here for you. You could, you have a new constitution. You could uh, devise new laws to fund education. Uh, the sky is the limit in your new state. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Mr. Pritzker, how would you characterize people here in Southern Illinois, the majority, who still support Donald Trump? Well, I don't care what part of the state I'm in. Donald Trump is still a racist and a xenophobe and a misogynist and a homophobe, and I'm gonna call him that. I don't care. I'm telling you, though, that many, yep. Mm -hmm. Please, no displays. Thank I, I'm you. telling Audience, you, please, though, please. that many of the people who voted for Donald Trump didn't vote for him because of that. They voted for him because we Democrats in 2016 didn't demonstrate that we were standing up for the kitchen table issues, the things that really matter to middle class families and those striving to get to the middle class, making college more affordable, making health care more affordable, um, making sure that we're creating jobs and raising wages. Those are the things that we Democrats have always stood for. We are the party that stands up for the middle class and those striving to get there. So I, I don't care that, you know, that I do not believe that people who voted for Donald Trump, that most of them are, uh, you know, share his characteristics, those that I named. I, I do believe that we Democrats have to address the economic circumstances of Southern Illinois. And that's why I put a jobs plan out that will create jobs all across Central and Southern Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Pritzker, Mr. Biss. Donald Trump is a racist and a bigot. That doesn't mean that his supporters are. I think Democrats have made a terrible mistake. In fact, I think Democrats have made two mirror image mistakes. We as a party got so obsessed with swing districts that if there were areas that were majority Republican, Democrats wrote them off. That happened in a lot of downstate. And if there were areas that were overwhelming majority Democratic, Democrats took them for granted. That happened in Chicago too. We need a party that's gonna be everywhere. We need a party that listens to everybody. We need a party that's built an infrastructure to take people seriously and run candidates and support them in every single corner in the state of Illinois. Stop taking people for granted, stop writing people off, and stop engaging in the politics of division and instead finally bring people together because an agenda that lifts people up across the state of Illinois is an agenda that can win everywhere. Mr. Diver. Well, it is not by my political nature that I call people names. Uh, my neighbors uh, voted for Donald Trump, and I have to get along with them. Uh, I come from the southern part of the state where this took place, and uh, I heard on KMOX radio People that were carpenters and labor guys said they don't care what their uh, leadership was telling them. They were with Trump, and they were going to put his signs up, and they were going to campaign for him because they were tired of the way that they were being treated and that the Democrats had a terrible candidate, and that was the truth. That was what they spoke. Now, I'll tell you why I'm running for governor, because Pat Quinn did not carry one county in southern Illinois other than Cook. He didn't carry one county. Now, you have to pick a candidate that's going to beat Bruce Rauner, that the independent voter is going to look at and is going to respect and is going to vote for them November of 2018. You know, the issue with Donald Trump remains his promises have been broken. There are no more coal miners in this part of the state that went back to work. There's no infrastructure money that has came here. He was false hope and false promise. Thank you, Mr. Neighbor. And that's Neighbor. a record. Thank you. Our third question. What do you consider, and this will start with uh, Chris Kennedy, what do you consider the ideal income tax approach for Illinois, considering the financial conditioning of the state? If you support a graduated income tax, uh, explain how you envision the income levels breaking down for different rates and how you would see the state through the years of work and campaigning it would take before a constitutional amendment could make it happen. In 60 seconds. In 60 seconds. Okay. <laughs> no problem. I won't problem. stop you in mid-sentence, so if it's no, a long sentence. No problem. 
I think we should go down a, a, a two-track approach towards a graduated progressive income tax. I think we need to fully fund our schools. It's our only hope at economic development. Our schools are funded now with local property taxes. We, we preserve that system in our state because a handful of elected officials, including the head of the Democratic Party or property tax appeals lawyers, they're preventing us from moving towards a graduated progressive income tax. We need to ban elected officials from having outside jobs that are adverse to the interests of the body they were elected to serve. They shouldn't be property tax appeals lawyers. Until they don't have that conflict, they're never going to be free to move us to a graduated income tax. We need to go down two routes. One is the long-term route to open up the state constitution. But in the short term, we need to adopt the Massachusetts model here in Illinois, where even with a flat tax requirement, our state constitution, we can introduce progressivity into that tax by refunding in a way sort of like the low income tax credit, taxes back to people in the middle class and lower class as we raise the taxes. So it's a two track approach. We can put the higher, uh, uh, we can put the short term approach in place by January of 2019 and set our state on the path to economic success. Thank you. Dr. Marshall. Well, I'm the only candidate here of the six who opposes the uh, graduate income tax. The graduate income tax is a ripoff. It is a tax increase for anybody who's doing well in this state. They say, oh, millionaires and billionaires are going to pay more. No, it's the middle class is going to wind up paying more with a graduate income tax. I think we should keep the tax flat like it is. I would try to decrease it back down to 4.5%. If we have a graduate income tax, billions and billions of extra dollars will come into Springfield. And who is in Springfield to receive all this money? Mike Madigan. Is that what you want? You've heard of, I've, I've heard of, you've heard of Russian collusion. We have Madigan collusion in this uh, contest here. I think anyone who's for graduate income tax is uh, colluding with Mr. Madigan. Okay. <laughs> J.B. Prisker. <laughs> we do need to reform the, the tax system in this state. You know, the reason that we need a progressive income tax is because we are taxing the middle class and those striving to get to the middle class at too high a rate and that we need to, we need to reduce the burden we need to reduce the burden on property owners for paying for schools. We need to make sure that the state steps up to the plate. That today in Illinois, only 26% of school funding comes from the state of Illinois, and most of the rest of it comes from local property taxes. So people wonder why property taxes are too high in the state. That is the problem. We are 49th or 50th in the nation in school funding uh, from the state. 49th or 50th. We have got to make sure that we change that. The average state in the United States, half the money comes from the state, half the money comes from local property taxes. That's what we need to do here. I also would legalize marijuana and tax it and regulate it. It, it, is, a, it is a racial justice issue, it's a safety issue, but there's 350 to $700 million available to the state if we do it. I would do it right away. Thank you. If it feels like our tax system here in Illinois is unfair, that's because it is. It's not like other states. We punish the middle class and the working poor because we don't have the guts as a state to ask millionaires and billionaires to pay their share. Illinois is a hard place to be a middle class homeowner. It's a great place to be a billionaire. <laughs> My wife Karen and I, we pay over 10% of our annual income in property taxes. I'm sure a lot of people in this room experience the same situation. Why? The original sin is the flat tax provision in the Illinois Constitution. It got put there in 1970. It says that if we were to try to ask Bruce Rauner and his $188 million 2015 salary to pay a higher rate than someone who teaches at SIU, that would be unconstitutional. It makes no sense. There's only four states that do it. We have to change that. But the question, Jim, is fair. We can't stop there because we need other approaches because that's going to take some time. We need to tax financial transactions at the Board of Trade in Chicago. That's where the money in our economy is. Let's tax it and fund a government that works. Robert Diver. Thank you. I'm going to answer your question directly because I've laid it out. I said the tax system in the state of Illinois is graduated between 1% to 6%. Now, everybody has to pay some income tax. That is the issue. And with a graduated tax system, everybody pays. Everybody. We cannot have exemptions because there are people that are extremely wealthy that 
shelter their, their, their earnings, they do not pay taxes. There are individuals who are in a, another category that have enough write-offs that they don't pay any taxes. The middle pays the, the bulk of the taxes in this state. So I said, from 20, the base of the progressive tax scale, as was modeled in many other states, is $25,000. Everybody's responsible for 1% of $25,000. From 25 to 45 is 2.25%. That was modeled after other states. From 45,000 on up is 3.75. From $150,000 up to a half a million is 4.95. We'll put another step in there. If you make a million dollars or more, you pay 6%. That tax model does several things. It brings in money for the pension system to make it whole. Sorry, I have to stop you there, sorry. I, yeah. I'll explain the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, sure. I have a plan. <laughs> Chris will explain to do it, too. <laughs> if you want to know how to do it, see me after the program. I've laid it out, it's ready to go. As governor, it'll happen in 2020. You ask when it would be implemented, 2020. <laughs> To your heart of it. Okay, yeah, we have a plan too, part of our 2020 vision for the state of Illinois. If you make 50,000 or less, you should only be paying one or 2% taxes. If you're making 50,000 or more, you're in the three to 5% range. And 250,000 to a million dollars, you should, you should be paying 6% taxes. If you're making a million dollars up to a billion dollars, you should be paying anywhere from eight to 10% taxes. This is what you call a graduated tax. It would definitely work for the people in Illinois. It's time for the wealthy people to pay their fair share of taxes. And with this progressive, you know, graduated tax, we can bring in about $3 billion of new revenue to the state of Illinois and help move the state forward. It's very important. I was born and raised in the heart of the ghetto myself on the south and west side of Chicago. I understand how it is to go out here and try to make a lot out of a little. So this is what I would do as your governor, make sure that we push this graduated tax formula. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to address the elephant in the room, Governor Rauner has inserted himself into the Democratic primary <laughs> like we have not seen before. In Southern Illinois and across the state, voters have been seeing an ad from Governor Rauner attacking J.B. Pritzker by using an FBI wiretap of Mr. Pritzker talking to former Governor Blagojevich and seeming to suggest that Mr. Pritzker did something illegal. In October 2015, I think we all remember Bernie Sanders jumping to Hillary Clinton's defense over the email scandal. Would any of you like to take a moment to defend <laughs> Mr. Pritzker <laughs> over this particular issue, this ad, or do you have your own concerns about it? Mr. Marshall, we'll start with you. <laughs> I answered this question already at the uh, Channel 7 or Channel 5 debate about a week ago. This ad is very damaging, and you're going to see it if he's elected in March. You're going to see it every day, 24 hours a day until November 8th or whenever it is. I think this makes Mr. Pritzker uh, unelectable. It's as simple as that, and uh, we have to think about what, five other people here who don't have this gigantic negative against them. Okay. Mr. Pritzker, would you like I get to, to jump to my own defense? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, uh, look, uh, nine years ago, I spoke with the governor about serving as state treasurer because, as some of you may recall, we were in a terrible economic crisis. And I have unique experience to offer to the state. I I've never made it a secret that I was willing to do public service. Now... Governor Rauner is using leaked portions of that conversation to attack me. Why? Because he's a failed governor and he knows that he can't beat me in the general election. I have fought to make a difference all across the state of Illinois throughout my life. It's why I'm running for governor. And I think we should stop allowing Bruce Rauner to play games in our Democratic primary and get about the important business of beating him. Senator Biss. I want us to picture October. There's a blue wave building across the country. We're thinking about how many seats in the House and Senate Democrats are gonna take back. What's the world gonna look like with Democrats in control of the House and the Senate? Except in Illinois, we're forced to play defense about Rod Blagojevich and FBI recordings. That is not good for Democrats. 
that is not the conversation that we want to be having in October of 2016 leading into this crucial election where we have to beat Bruce Rauner. Bruce Rauner is on the ropes. Bruce Rauner is in trouble. Bruce Rauner is a failure. The only way he can win is if he's able to make that kind of attack about unpopular politicians like Rod Blagojevich and Mike Madigan. If J.B. Pritzker didn't exist, Bruce Rauner would have to invent him. It's too dangerous. We can't afford to nominate J.B. Pritzker. Thank you, Senator Biss. Mr. Diver's turn. Okay. The issue with Governor Blagojevich, as we all know, deals with not a conversation with him, but it's money. And I, I personally will say this, I think J.B. is innocent as long as there's no money that's been exchanged. If there is money that comes up in this, then he's not. And I think it should be investigated. That's my feelings on it. But he's innocent. I mean, plain and simple, I'll say that. But I want to say this, is that I go door to door for candidates. And maybe you do too. So what do you say about this? And I think you need to be ready to make an explanation about it as well as I do. Mr. Hardiman. Like I've said this before, and uh, the reason I would ask people to vote for myself, T.O. Hardiman, and Patricia Avery is because I don't have nothing to do with none of this mess. You hear me? <laughs> 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 but let me say this. And, and, and JB can speak up good. <laughs> JB can speak up good for itself. But Bruce Rauner ran on a premise that he was going to shake up, you know, Illinois, Springfield. But the only people he shook up was the poor and working class people of Illinois. Okay? Bruce Rauner also stated that he was uh, not in charge. If you're not in charge, you need to sit down and get out the way. Mm. So really, let a real governor step up and take lead here in Illinois. And secondly, he was on the record. Yeah, I take that clap. I definitely take it. <laughs> But you know, let me say this too. Bruce Rauner recently said on the news that he would ask Amazon to move their second headquarters to St. Louis, Missouri. This is the governor of the state of Illinois saying it would boost the economy in Illinois, but why not have them to move to East St. Louis? K. Rowe. I mean, seriously. So uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not here to like you know speak up for nobody, but as long as the person hasn't broken the law, what, what is the argument there? The people in Illinois are hurting right now. We have 1.7 million people living in poverty in Illinois close to 900,000 people uninsured, and Bruce Rauner has failed policies, policies all over the place. Thank the you, young, Mr. Hardiman. That's it, okay, thank, thank you. you, all right. Mr. Kennedy, do you have any concerns about this? Um, well, I'd say I, I enjoy being with Dr. Marshall. I, I, I don't agree with him that we should legalize morphine. I, <laughs> I, I definitely don't agree that we should divide the state in three, um, but I, I agree with him when he says that that tape makes J.B. Pritzker unelectable in a general election. The, the truth is just because you don't break a law doesn't mean you're innocent. And we need to, we need to hold our elected officials to a higher standard. We're going to make the same mistake that we made in 2016 as a party. Allow the insiders to choose a candidate, raise him up before he's properly vetted and then lose in the general election. The, the Republican strategy across the United States is voter suppression. They have a four-point strategy. Government's broken. Politicians are corrupt. There's nothing you can do about it. Don't bother voting. That's how they suppress the Democratic vote. And JB's actions on that tape, trying to buy that office, makes him the poster child, the data point that proves their voter suppression narrative is true. Brandon, may I at least respond yes, to, yes. to since the question is entirely about me? Uh, I, you know, I, I, let me begin by saying, let's not be naive. Bruce Rauner is going to attack anyone that is the Democratic nominee and anyone that he thinks that he can't beat in the general election, he is going to attack. There, nobody is immune from Bruce Rauner and all of what he will do on television. Um, I also want to say that as I travel around the state and I've met you know, thousands of Democrats, uh, I, I hear about the devastation that Bruce Rauner has wrought upon the state. But I, I have never heard any of them say to me that Bruce Rauner should be applauded or that Bruce Rauner speaks truth to power or, or frankly, that Bruce Rauner is improving the economy. Um, but 10 days ago, Chris Kennedy said all of those positive things about Bruce Rauner. That may be why Bruce Rauner would like to run against Chris Kennedy in the general election. Now, uh, in contrast, I think Bruce Rauner is the problem in the state of Illinois. And, you know, after three years in office, no jobs, no health care, no education funding, 
Bruce Rauner has got to go, and I will take him out. Thank you. I respond. Hey, Chris, uh, 30 seconds. Yes. OK. Um, you know, I campaigned against Bruce Rauner when he was campaigning against Pat Quinn. I traveled the entire state. I think the fact that he threw a million people out of government programs proves that he's heartless. I think the fact that he went two years without a budget makes him incompetent. But I think when he criticizes the pay-to-play culture in our state, he's not wrong. And JB has emerged as the poster child of that system. And the fact is we'll never get all the Democrats to turn out, progressive independents and progressive Republicans to join us for a win in, December, in November if he's the standard bearer of our party. That's just the truth. Okay. Uh, uh, let's move on to another question. Hold on. Uh, but this may, may help you. I actually planned this for, for later, but this may be a good time for this question. Um, some of you have criticized others of you in your campaigns. We've seen that here tonight. We've seen it at other times. Um, only one of you is going to get elected on March 20th. Uh, when that happens, um, are you able to endorse any of the other candidates? And, and if you are, how will you comfort those voters who you've been telling shouldn't elect that person? Uh, JB, let's start with you. Well, let me begin <laughs> by saying to all of you that I have run a positive campaign. I think many of you have seen the ads that I've run or have heard me speak. I have not spoken ill of my opponents. They have attacked me on occasion, and I've had to defend myself. But I must say that I think that we should be talking about the issues that are important to the people of Illinois and not attacking each other as Democrats. We should be pulling together to beat Bruce Rauner. Now, I also want to say that, uh, that we are unfortunately in a world where Bruce Rauner is not going to run a positive campaign and talk about his accomplishments because he has none. And so you've seen that every single day, my campaign and I have taken after Bruce Rauner. We have shown people his failures every single day. We talk to the media, we talk to all of you, and I've been on television telling people what it is that Bruce Rauner has done wrong. But it is going to be a fight of our lifetime because even though he's got a 30% approval rating in the state, remember that Donald Trump had a 30% approval rating and he won. And you know how he did it? He drove the approval rating of his opponent down further. And that's going to happen to Democrats if we're not careful. Have we to have to stand up and fight. And I will do that. I have to stop you there. But one question you didn't answer. Would you support anybody who wins? I, 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 every single person on the stage, any of them, would be a better governor than Bruce Rauner. I will support whoever wins the Democratic nomination. Please, no displays. Dan? We have to fight Bruce Rauner, and I will work as hard for whoever the Democratic nominee is as I will if it's me. I'm for any one of these people, and I will work my tail off to make sure the Democratic nominee beats Bruce Rauner. We cannot afford four more years of this. Now, that means we got to nominate the strongest candidate. That means we need a real primary. That means we need an actual vigorous debate about what profile and what type of person, what background, what policy agenda, and what vision is right ignites people and motivates people and motivates people to go to the polls. That's why we need to have a tough primary. That's we need, why we need to have these issues out now so we're not vulnerable to Bruce Rauner. This is a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party, and we better have a primary that makes those decisions. But I have a question for you, JB. You've contributed $42 million to your primary campaign for governor so far. Will you pledge to contribute at least $42 million to the general election campaign regardless of who the nominee is? Well, one of the advantages uh, of having run the campaign that I've run is that we've put together a campaign that will win in the general election. And we've built the infrastructure up for the party to win up and down the ticket. I will support whoever the Democratic nominee is. I will also tell you that um, I will not be beholden to anybody. You know, Senator Biss, I appreciate the question, but you've taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from Springfield insiders and lobbyists and bankers. 
And frankly, you've changed your position on quite a number of things over the years. And I, I think I would ask this, the question back to you. Will you pledge not to take money from those interests who apparently have changed your position on pensions, changed your position on charter schools, and so many other things? Okay, so please, I'm, no displays, please, please. Give them 30 seconds. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. I'm incredibly proud of the fundraising that we have. It's from ordinary people. And those vague accusations that don't mention a single contribution are because of the remarkable way we funded our campaign, something I'm proud of and something I would stand by. And so that's the way we're going to fund our campaign in the general election. And I will happily accept a contribution from you the day after the primary, well, JB. The tens but of what's thousands surprising, of dollars that you accepted But what's surprising from is Mike you weren't Madigan? prepared to answer that question. Interest? What's surprising is you weren't prepared to answer that question. And the idea that you want to hold the Democratic Party hostage and offer to fund the general election only if you're the nominee seems to me to be really problematic. Okay, let's move on to Thank Bob Diver. Um, yes, I'll support any candidate on the stage because that's what I've always done. You know, Bob Diver's always been the Democrat in the street. Ask Glenn Bichard. Ask anybody that's ever run in Madison County who they've came to. Who put up the signs? Who pushed the literature? Who does the work in the street? So why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I support anybody here? Because I always have and I always will. Okay? But the question I have to you as a voter, because I know how you live. When you go to your mailbox in the morning and you see your neighbor at the mailbox and you're both taking out this political literature, who's easiest to sell? Some guy from southern Illinois that has a FOID card that the people in Chicago said you better watch him because he owns a gun? Or, or is it some rich guy, you know, that's got millions of dollars. It's not at all like them, you know? You know, whose values can you sell to your voters? That's why we lost in 14. Wake up. That's why we lost in 16. Wake up. Okay, time's You've up. You've got to have a guy that you can sell, that you can market, okay, sorry. that understands Southern Illinois. I listen to everybody else, so I'm going to say my piece. Right. <laughs> I, I don't have billions, and I'm not taking special interest money and all that stuff. Right. Too hard, man. Well, not to repeat myself, that's why I said earlier I have nothing to do with none of this mess. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> so let me say this to you. Now, do not count out State Representative Ives. And the reason I say that because Bruce Rauner may not even be the nominee. We have a woman that has decided to take on this billionaire tyrant, okay? Let's not count this young lady out. But on the Democratic side, I would definitely support the nominee. But I plan to be the nominee. I'm the only candidate sitting up here that ran before, picked up 30 counties downstate, and I ran against Pat Quinn, and they said I would only have 5% of the state vote. We had 28.1% of the state vote. We can defeat Bruce Rauner. He's done. The man already said he wasn't in charge, like I talked about earlier. He's not in charge. So he's, a, he's done all the way. So I would like to ask everybody to just take a good look at T.O. Hardiman and Patricia Avery for governor and lieutenant governor because we have a plan to move the state of Illinois forward. And the way we're going to beat Bruce Rauner, we're going to turn our campaign into a big major movement in Illinois a big major movement. We're already doing pretty good on social media. We're doing good on the ground level. And I would like to be seen as the nine, you know, nine billionaire candidate, an alternative to big money. And, and on behalf of myself and my running mate, we have decided to take the higher road during this campaign. I'm not gonna go out here and okay, try to knock JB, or none of these people, Chris Kennedy, Biss or nobody, because the people are hurting in Illinois. That's the picture I would like to paint. Let's help the people you, and keep yeah, the focus sorry, on I positivity. I had to just copy off Bob. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I can't let anybody go. <laughs> Chris Kennedy. So I, I'm, the, I'm the eighth of 11 kids. We, when I was growing up, softball was over. We played hardball. We played touch football. And they were bloody games. People got hurt. I broke my nose. Lots of other things, too. But once that game was over, once that game was over, we didn't talk about it. Jump. Came back into dinner, had dinner with our mother. We were one unified family. And that's the way I'm going to treat this election. I'm going to back at anybody here. Except you, Doc. I'm not <laughs> crazy about that idea. <laughs> Everybody else. It's which one? What? <laughs> That's the idea. There are three governorships available, <laughs> however, under this plan. You could probably buy one of those states. 
And Dr. Marshall. Well, this is a, well. I I have taken objection with all these men because of the massive increase in taxes that they're proposing. The single payer system, massive increase in federal taxes. Preschool education, massive increase in property taxes. Graduated tax, but if any of them wins, I will support them. However, <laughs> if I win, <laughs> will you support my idea of dividing the state up into three states? <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is fair. This is fair, gentlemen. <laughs> Show them the map. Show them okay, this you want next. Want to see my map? You want to see the map? How do you follow that? My You're map. To see the map. <laughs> okay, please. Can we get some? Oh, okay, sorry, please, 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 please. Okay, Dr. Marshall, please. This is it. <laughs> That's your, Mr. Kennedy asked me to do that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and, and afterwards, I will gladly show you this, uh, all the, the map and everything. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Okay. Okay, this next question has to in do with transparency. transparency. Democrats have criticized Governor Rauner for releasing only partial tax returns, yet two candidates at least on this stage have only released partial tax returns. Critics say what they released barely skims the surface in providing the public information about where their money comes from, any tax loopholes they might have taken advantage of, should Illinois require, by law, candidates for elected office to release their full tax returns, including documents, attachments, schedules, or should some personal financial information be off limits to the public? Senator Biss. I was proud to introduce legislation in Springfield that says you cannot appear on the ballot for president in the state of Illinois unless you've released five years of full tax returns. That's something that we passed out of the Senate. I hope they'll pass it out of the House. Donald Trump has taught us an important lesson. Let us never make that mistake again. And I think the same requirement ought to apply to candidates for governor. That's why I've released five years of my full tax returns. Complete information, complete transparency. The people of Illinois deserve to know. People in Illinois don't trust their government. They don't know if their government's on their side. They deserve to know what their governor's financial interests are. I think it's actually astonishing astonishing that in the era of Donald Trump, two candidates on this stage, Chris Kennedy and J.B. Pritzker, will not release their full tax returns. I think it weakens the Democratic Party in our effort to call Donald Trump out, and it leaves us totally unsure what the financial interests of these candidates are. Just this past weekend, more questions were raised about J.B.'s use of offshore trusts and shell companies in other states, and the truth is, we can't really get to the bottom of it, because he will not release his tax returns. Thank you, Senator Biz. Mr. Diber. I, I think I'm the most transparent candidate on the stage. I think I'm the only one that's released five years of Illinois state tax returns, IL 1040s. My wife Karen and I uh, filed those. Uh, we also released, uh, we were asked to release five years of our federal uh, 1040s. We released all those with all of our schedules, fully disclosed all of our income. The press indicated to me that they don't think they received that level of transparency from any candidate. So I think if we're going to talk about releasing your tax returns, I first and foremost want to know how much Illinois income tax you paid, because as governor, that's the revenue I'm most concerned about. I want to know how much state income tax you're paying if you're going to become governor. Mr. Hardiman. Now, I have no problem with releasing tax returns. Uh, when I release my tax returns, you're going to see that I represent the 99.9% .9 of the working class people and poor people in Illinois, seriously. So I have no issue with that. Uh, I, I must say this when it comes to transparency. Part of our plan is to videotape 
our meetings with special interest groups and lobbyists so there would be no margin for corruption in Illinois. And I think that's new for the state of Illinois. So if you have an issue with what happened in that meeting you want to know, just go get volume number one or volume number two. So therefore, we can avoid corruption on all levels. That's the problem right now that we have. But I have no problem with that. I mean, going back five years, I think three years should be sufficient instead of five years. But, you know, I don't think the press would be interested in my tax returns anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kennedy, right. can we get yeah. a pledge from you right. tonight that you will release your full tax returns before the March 20th primary? Well, no, you, you, you can't. Right. I mean, I, I think that the truth is I've, I've disclosed incredible detail about every share of every stock I own and all of the trusts I've benefited from, everything that they hold in financial disclosure forms that provide much greater disclosure than anything you'd get from three or five years of uh, tax returns. The, the notion of trying to get at this information from tax returns is, is wrongheaded. What we need is a Financial Disclosure Act in the state of Illinois that forces anybody, an elected official, any elected official, any appointed uh, official, to disclose what they hold and who they owe so that all of us know what their benefit, beneficiaries are of any decisions that they make. You'll never get that from a uh, income tax form. And when I disclosed, I disclosed way more information than was required so that I could set a standard for everybody else. So when people come into government and they work for me, they know what's gonna be expected of them. Should candidates be required by law? I think candidates should be required by law not to disclose a, 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 a uh, I don't think disclosing tax returns goes nearly far enough because the information in there does not provide full disclosure in a way that a disclosure form often used by other states, partially used by the state of Illinois. And if you look at my disclosures, every stock I own is disclosed. And I think that should be the bare minimum standard for everybody else. And the truth is, I, I don't believe everybody's done that. That's a different question, though. Mr. Marshall? You did. No, I think it should be... Uh revealed. <clears throat> um, I'm a physician. I made $160,000 last year. Uh, my, uh, I own a home. That's it. I just disclosed everything to you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to realize what Mr. Pritzker is doing, by the way. According to the article in the Tribune, he has billions of dollars socked away someplace in some Caribbean island, and he reports what he wants to for income. And at the same time, he's asking us to pay more via a graduated income tax. That's not fair. He's next. He can defend himself. But according to what I've read in the, pay, in the Tribune, this is what is going on. He, he declared $5.9 million and then $16 million. And he's spending forty to $60, 60 million this year. So there's a lot of money there that's hidden somewhere. And he's not paying taxes on it. Is that fair? So, Mr. Pritzker, before you, you start, yeah, I'm yes. going to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Kennedy. Can we get a pledge from you tonight, a promise that you will release your full tax return with the schedules and the attachments, the full returns before the primary? Well, I agree that, that you all ought to know every asset, every investment that any candidate that's running and, and wins has, and I've done that. I put out three years of personal income taxes, um, state and federal, by the way, um, uh, three years of uh, taxes on the trust for my benefit, state and federal, and we pay the highest rate of tax here in Illinois. Uh, put out three years of contributions, charitable contributions, and a statement of economic interest that lists every single asset and investment of mine or that's in a trust for my benefit. Now, I just want to say, though, that you know, for uh, Dan Biss and for Dr. Marshall, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not to your own facts. Um, those trusts uh, were created for, uh, they were created generations ago, and every single disbursement that comes from those trusts goes to charity. In fact, hundreds of millions of dollars have gone to mental health programs and to uh, teacher training and after school programs and to food banks. Um, and I'm proud of all of that. Now, I know that some political consultant advised Dan Biss that it's time to start attacking and distorting my record. But the truth is that you all ought to focus on the real issues that are facing middle class families, working families all across the state of Illinois, and how we're going to beat Bruce Rauner. Mr. Pritzker, how many pages of your tax return, 
How many pages did they total, what you released? We released the, the, the schedule at the top, which is the two pages, the same type of two pages that, that, that uh, Chris Kennedy re released. And hey, the most important me thing, this, man. The, the, but you're in it. Uh, and, and, and the truth is that the, the most important thing that you can look at is whether there are conflicts. Look at what Bruce Rauner has done. On the back porch of the governor's mansion, it turns out he's doing business in office. He should be called out. I'm calling him out. Thank you, Mr. Pritzker, Senator Biss. Uh, JB said that I'm not entitled to my own facts. I just think I should be entitled to know the facts about JB's finances. And you have them. He will not tell us even, check this one out, check this out. He won't even tell us a list of the names of the trusts he's a beneficiary of. We're completely in the dark, and it's not right. And this is not about what some political consultant sorry, advised. Dan, this is about Dan. something I've been yeah. talking about okay, since Dan, this race sorry. began. Dan, I've Dan, been talking that's about that's this since this pleasure. race began because it's important. Okay. The people of Illinois need to know whose side I, their governor's on. Again, political okay. consultants advising. Okay, let's move on uh, and give the audience, of course, some uh, a chance. Here's a question from the audience. Um, what structural changes need to be made to make Illinois a more attractive and competitive place for companies to do business. And then Dan, I think it's your turn to go first, is that right? I'd be more than happy to, but to be fair, I think it was Bob. Bob, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, well, well, first of all, Illinois needs a marketing plan. That we do not have, and that's why we are not attracting businesses to Southern Illinois or any, any place else. I said this, you know, an eclipse is only gonna happen uh, once in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you, you know, that, that was twice, okay, well, good. <laughs> so uh, look, we, we could have one every year down here, I realize that. Uh, I read the Marion Star and saw what the uh, tourism uh, boost was from that, and that was fantastic. But, but, you know, we need to do several things in this state structurally. One, we need to invest in infrastructure in the state if we're going to attract business, because that's one of the prime things. We have to invest in human capital to have a highly skilled, trained workforce. And the other structural thing that the Diver Administration will do is it will really look at the permitting as to what we require businesses to do when they move into the state of Illinois so that they can open their doors and start making a profit right away. Those are structural changes. You know, the one structural change that I said I will not make and that I will not allow Illinois to become a state of right to work for less, that we will, <laughs> we, we will in Illinois remain a strong union state, we will remain and have prevailing wage, we'll have project labor agreements, and we will collective bargain all of our contracts in this state for public and private sector workers, and we will open our doors to any individual that wants to come here and do business, and we will assist them with both Workforce Investment Act money and Workforce Initiative money, and this state okay. needs to put forth an economic development plan as part of marketing. Thank you. Thank you, Tio. Yeah, as far as uh, structural changes, uh, my running mate, Patricia Avery, we, we're real strong on economic development here in the state of Illinois. I think it's very important for a governor's administration to make sure that small businesses are provided with more subsidies and incentives so they can stay in business. There's too much emphasis being placed on big, big Fortune 500 companies. We can provide those big companies with some incentives, but not as much as we do all the time. It's very important that we look at all of Illinois, but once we become the governor, lieutenant governor, I have a plan to spend $50 million on capital construction uh, jobs and, you know, capital capital construction projects in central and southern Illinois to help boost the economy here. That's something we can do right now for the good people statewide, but we have to put an emphasis on, uh, emphasis on everybody in Illinois. That's the problem right now. You have a few people. That's why the machine is broken right now. Everything that has happened in Illinois so far has happened under the uh, present Democratic machine. Our campaign is powered by the people. That's what we plan to listen to as far as the structural changes. That's how you do it, though. You build the economy from the bottom up instead of the top down. That's the biggest issue we have. That's how we got Donald Trump. That's how we got Bruce Rauner. It's okay. time to change the narrative in Illinois and vote for somebody that comes from the working class population sincerely. I've been working for, oh, yeah. Thank you. That's Thank good you. enough. Chris Kendi. So I think economic development is the number one issue. That's what we have to concentrate on more than anything else. There's only been one economic plan that's ever worked in multiple cities in multiple decades in the United States, the power of education, particularly higher ed. You see the success in Silicon Valley, in Austin, Texas, in Research Triangle, North Carolina, in Pittsburgh, in Akron, in Boston. All of those places are 
are, are thriving because they're built around a, a university, a research university like SIU. That's why Chicago's doing so well, because it's now the largest college town in America. It has surpassed Boston. That's why headquarters are moving there, to be around those highly educated young people. The question is for all of us, are those our young people? Are those kids from Illinois, or are they from somewhere else? Because we lack a pipeline of highly educated high school and grade school kids capable of filling those slots because we pay for our schools with property taxes because a handful of elected officials, including Mike Madigan, make money as property tax appeals lawyers. We got to get the dirty money out of politics, we get the dirty politicians out of government, and we'll fix this state. Thank you. Well, Dr. Dr. <clears throat> structural changes. Taxes are too high in this state. I would, I'm against a, a graduated income tax because new businesses will bring high paid people, uh, people making $100,000 or more. I will, uh, so I'll say to them, I'm not going to screw your employees by, uh, with a graduated income tax. I'm opposed to all other taxes too, gasoline, cigarette, sales, any other uh, state tax. Now property taxes are the big problem. They are far too high in this state. What I would like to do is legalize marijuana and then use all that billions of dollars as a direct a payment to property owners. And that's how you get property tax relief in this state, and that's how you attract uh, businesses to this state. Okay. Structural changes. Well, let's start with the fact that under Bruce Rauner, we've created almost no jobs in this state. Almost no jobs. We're in the bottom third of job creation in the entire United States. So the first structural change is get rid of Bruce Rauner. Now, we also need to create jobs here, and I've done that. In fact, as I said, thousands and thousands of jobs have been created in a small business incubator that I founded, my own businesses. Um, I believe that we need to invest in small businesses. We need to make sure that small businesses have the capital that they need to get started and to grow, and we can create a small business loan fund, and we can provide technical assistance and mentorship. Then we need to invest in infrastructure. For goodness sakes, we need to rebuild our roads and bridges, our higher education institutions. It's time already, 10 years since we had a capital bill. And then we've got to make sure we're expanding ag markets for our farmers and then bring manufacturing back to Illinois. All of those things we can do. Look at the model that Minnesota provided, putting in a progressive income tax, paying off their pension debt in doing so, raising wages across the state, and having a budget surplus. Thank you. Here's what I believe. I, I believe that Southern Illinois can be an extraordinary economic engine. It's true we can't control when the next eclipse happens, but this is a beautiful, beautiful region of the state between the rivers, between the wine country. This is a region that should be a tourist hub but the state needs to meet Southern Illinois halfway with the kinds of investments that will make that happen. We need the kind of infrastructure investments that have been tragically lacking for a long time in Illinois and especially under Bruce Rauner. Investing, yes, in roads and bridges and schools, but also in water infrastructure and universal access to broadband so that the modern economy is everywhere in Illinois, not just in a few places. We need to invest properly in, in higher education. Higher education which creates jobs, which creates economic opportunity, and is that fundamental rung on the ladder of opportunity. We have to have a state that invests in people, that sees the potential everywhere in Illinois, and that makes the investments needed to unleash that potential. That's what you have to do to create jobs. Finally, we need a system where the thumb is not on the scale on behalf of the largest corporations and the very wealthy and against everyone else, but instead where a level playing field allows new businesses and small businesses to grow and thrive where you don't need a lobbyist to go to Springfield to have a fair shake, but instead anybody with a great idea can start a successful business. Okay, thank you. And our time has uh, run out, so we're at the end of our program. We thank you all very much, but uh, before we all conclude, I'd like to give the candidates each an opportunity, starting with T.O. Hardiman, to take one minute uh, for a concluding statement. Uh, can I stand up there? Mm. Is that okay? Why not? You stand right here if you want to. All right, cool. Okay, once again, T.O. Hardiman, I'm running for governor for the second time. Our campaign is powered by the people. Your voice is our mission. 
When I ran in 2014, I won 30 counties downstate. I want to make that crystal clear because we can do it again. I'm asking all of my friends from Southern Illinois to vote for us again so we can bring our 2020 plan and make it materialize to help everybody in Illinois. It's not always what Illinois can do for everybody. It's what we also can help do for Illinois as well. But our plan is uh, fail-proof. Our plan includes supporting the veterans, the progressive tax, increasing the minimum wage of $15 an hour, and then also helping small businesses stay in business at the same time, making sure that we reduce gun violence across Illinois. That's a passion of ours. Supporting women's rights and making sure that we all are on the same level playing field in Illinois. Our website is hardermanforillinois.org. You can follow, join our movement. Uh, we need all hands on deck, and together we can make history here in Illinois. We can defeat Bruce Rauner. I'm not worried about Bruce Rauner. The reality is that it's time for him to go, and I need everybody to just take a look at our website, support our campaign. We're powered by the people, and we represent a new way forward. Our campaign represents a new way forward for Illinois, okay? Thank you all very much for listening to me tonight. All right. Kennedy. Well, thank you all. This has been a very entertaining format, and uh, I hope you, hope you all have enjoyed it. I think the thing that makes us different as Democrats from Republicans is that we believe that government can be people's ally. It can be helpful to them. It can, well, help, help us educate our children, keep our communities safe, take care of our elderly parents, give them retirement security and the health care that they deserve. The government can invest in our economy and more importantly in the people that that economy was meant to serve. We need, we need to bring others along with that vision though. We need those independents. We need progressive Republicans. And they're never gonna support us in that broad view, that mission, if they think that our elected officials are corrupt or the product of a machine hell-bent on destroying the economy if only to make themselves wealthy. We need to get that dirty money out of politics so we can get those dirty politicians out of government. We need servant leaders, not leaders of servants. We can't make the same mistake in Illinois that we made at the federal level. We need each of you to turn out, to vote, to fight on every block of every street, of every precinct, of every ward, of every township, of every county across the state. And if we do that, we can turn Illinois around. Thank Stop you either. all very much. Thank you. Robert Marshall. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, what we have to do tonight in the next few weeks is to find out who is best to, be, to win in, no, in November. And I think I'm, I think I'm the, the one that can do that. I don't have any gigantic negatives, first of all. I've never had my phone tapped by the FBI, I don't have any money hidden someplace in some Caribbean island. I don't have any gigantic negatives that's gonna show up on your TV in some sort of uh, ad. I think I can uh, unite this state uh, the, in this, the southern part. I, uh, my idea is listen, that, please? Thank you. Uh, my, I, I think all, all of these other candidates are gonna be very, have a difficult time getting elected because of, of all their plans, which will result in massive increase in multiple taxes. I don't see how anybody can get elected in November with all these tax increases, and I'm opposed to all of them. My idea on legalizing uh, marijuana is another thing that will unite the state, I think, and generate new money. I'll I think I can win better, best than, uh, of all the uh, people on the stage here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. J.B. Prisker. Thank you. I'm running for governor because everything that we care about right now is under siege. That we have challenges in this state, and I've spent my life fighting for social and economic justice, expanding school breakfasts across the state, making sure that kids get quality preschool and quality child care, thousands of them, making sure we're teaching them to fight for civil rights 60,000 kids every single year learn in a program that I created, and creating jobs. We need to get all of those big things done here in the state of Illinois. We've got big challenges to meet, and I think you want somebody to be your governor who knows how to organize and accomplish the goal of overcoming the big challenges of the state of Illinois. So 
I want you to know that we're going to put Springfield back on the side of working families. That's why so many working families and unions and leaders have come to support me in this campaign. I ask you for your support in this campaign. I ask you for your vote in March and then in November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this evening. This is so important. We have to defeat Bruce Rauner, and these kind of conversations are going to help us make sure our party is ready to defeat Bruce Rauner. But we also know that it's not enough to just beat Bruce Rauner, because things weren't good enough here in Illinois before Bruce Rauner became governor. It's time for us to have a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party and a fight for the future of Illinois. We have to decide, are we going to be the billionaire party or are we going to be the people's party? Are we going to have elections or are we going to have auctions? And the point of that decision is that we have to decide to change what's possible in the state of Illinois because what was possible for the last 30 years just was not good enough for families struggling trying to get by, families trying to figure out how to afford health care, tuition, and child care. I'm Daniel Biss, and I'm running for governor because I know that we can change what's possible, and when we do that, we can have the Illinois that we have always dreamt of. It would be an honor to have your support. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for listening this evening. Um, I'm Bob Diver, and I'm running for governor because I believe there's more that unites the state than divides us. I believe everyone wants a good paying job, they want a quality public school, and they want a safe neighborhood. But I know this, that if we're going to change Springfield, we gotta change the leadership that's there, and that's why I'm running. You know, people in this part of the state said this, they wanted to change leadership, and that's why Gary Forby's not a senator, and that's why John Bradley is not a representative. But they changed it with the wrong people. They changed it with people that they wanted to have a voice from Southern Illinois. I'm the first person, as I told you, in 20 years to run for governor as a Democrat from Southern Illinois. There's a different view as to what a Southern Illinois Democrat is about, and I, it's based on values. And that's what I bring to this race. That's what I bring that will give us a victory in November of 2018. I bring a candidacy that is electable because of 20 years experience as a local elected official, I have more experience than everybody else if you added up all their years of serving in government. You don't wake up one day and decide I'm you done. want to govern. Thank you. It takes effort. Thank you. Got your name on it. Thank you again all for coming. Could we please have one more hand for all the candidates? <laughs> Thank you. If you're not registered to vote, register. If you are, we hope that uh, you'll be a smarter voter now. Thank you.